Hi, I'm Maddie. Hi, I'm Mackenzie. And I'm Annie. Today we will be discussing the novel Looking for Alaska. This book received amazing awards, including New York Times bestseller, winner of the Michael L. Pritz Award, as well as the following reviews. What sets this novel apart is the brilliant, insightful, suffering, but enduring voice of Miles Halter by the Chicago Tribune. Funny, sad, inspiring, and always compelling by book page. And alive with sweet, self-deprecating humor, Green draws Alaska so lovingly in self-loathing darkness as well as in energetic light by the School Library Journal. Looking for Alaska is about Miles Halter leaving his home in Florida to attend the Culver Creek Boarding School in Birmingham, Alabama. When Miles is at school, he befriends Chip, Alaska, and Takumi. Miles spends a lot of his time at school trying to understand Alaska better and makes very little progress. Miles is very happy to have finally have made friends. In addition to making friends for the first time in his life, Miles spends much of his time at Culver Creek learning to break the rules. One night, Alaska dares Miles to make out with her. They do until Alaska says that she is sleepy and asks Miles to be continued. Everyone falls asleep until Miles and the colonel are woken up by his, by a hysterical Alaska. She enlists their help in distracting the eagle so that she can leave campus. Miles and the colonel have no idea why she is upset or where she wants to go, but they distract the eagle long enough for her to leave. The next morning, the eagle announces to the school that Alaska died in a car crash the night before. Miles and the colonel spend much of the rest of the year dealing with their grief and hoping to figure out why Alaska left and whether she intended to kill herself or not. Miles and the colonel get into a number of fights and both fall into depression. Eventually, the friends decide to memorialize Alaska by pulling the prank she planned for their senior year. A few days later, with Takumi's help, Miles and the colonel realize that the night Alaska died was the anniversary of her mother's death. Alaska had forgotten to put flowers on her mother's gravestone, and so she had drunkenly driven off campus with that purpose. Miles ends up deciding that he doesn't care whether or not Alaska committed suicide, because in the end, he loves her no matter what. The novel concludes with Miles returning to his quest for the great perhaps, and deciding that forgiveness is the best way out of the labyrinth of suffering. When Miles arrives at Culver Creek, one of the first things the colonel in Alaska convinced him to do is start smoking cigarettes. Miles says he doesn't really have a reason for smoking, but to him, it just seems like the thing to do. At the beginning of the novel, at least, smoking represents fitting in for Miles. For the colonel in Alaska, smoking cigarettes is a way of defying authority, something the colonel makes very clear when he smokes in front of the Pelham police officer. However, even if Alaska smokes to be cool, she also smokes because she is sad. She tells others, y'all smoke to be cool, I smoke to die. Smoking was something her mother did before she died, and smoking is, for Alaska, an activity connected to her mother's death. And while the others seem to smoke as a way to pass time or keep up appearances, Alaska invests in the fact that she is knowingly bringing about her own slow demise through smoking. Once she dies, smoking takes on a new meaning. All that is left of her vague memory, like the smoke ring she used to blow. Another symbol in the book are white daisies, which symbolize her mother. Before her death, Alaska's mother put daisies in Alaska's hair. White daisies are traditional symbols of innocence. Alaska remembers the anniversary of her mother's death when she realizes that she is doodling white daisies while on her phone, and she takes the white tulips Jake has given her to put on her mother's grave. Alaska dies with these flowers by her side, and they symbolize knowledge that might have saved Alaska from death. White tulips traditionally represent worthiness and forgiveness, and had Alaska been able to forgive herself and understand that she had value, perhaps she would not have left Culver Creek that night. At the same time, the white flowers also act as memorials for Alaska herself as she died with them in her car. Miles is obsessed with the last words of famous people, and in the novel, he says, it was an indulgence, learning last words. Other people had chocolate. I had dying declarations. These last words have more meaning for him than what many people think last words mean. He tells Laura, A lot of times, people die how they live, 
And so last words tell me a lot about who people were and why they became the sort of people biographies get written about. Does that make sense? Miles likes last words because they let him know, in summary, how a person lived and died, which makes not knowing Alaska's last words even worse. Miles uses the last words of people to give closure to their lives, but with Alaska, he needs to find closure another way. One of the clearest symbols in looking for Alaska is the labyrinth. Labyrinths are different from mazes in that labyrinths have only one possible path, while mazes have many different potential paths. Whether Alaska intended to die or not, she seems certain that her life will be an unhappy one, and that the only way to survive will be straight and fast, either to go through it recklessly or not to go through it at all. Miles has a more Christian understanding of labyrinths. In Christianity, with which Green is very familiar with, labyrinths symbolize a journey towards salvation. Miles embraces the labyrinth nature of life, and once he decides to move forward, he is excited about where the path might take him. These symbols all come together to create the theme of friendship and particular loyalty among friends. It is extremely important at Culver Creek. The colonel emphasizes to Miles that under no circumstances should he tell on a fellow student, and Alaska suffers emotionally for having done so to her roommate, Mariah. This code of loyalty encourages the students to forgive one another, or at least not to hold grudges. Friends are willing to take the fall for other friends if necessary, and when Alaska does this for Miles, she does not hold her punishment against him. Further, most kids are willing to forgive one another even if they have been disloyal. For example, once Kevin has played a prank on Miles, he asks for the colonel for a truce because he feels the colonel has been adequately punished for telling on Mariah which of course he did not in fact do. While the colonel does not grant the truce, he ultimately forgives Kevin while he enlists his help to pull off the Alaska. Young Memorial Prank. An important quote that exemplifies this major theme is shown on page 106. Anyway, when you get in trouble, just don't tell anyone. I mean, I hate the rich snots here with a fervent passion. I usually reserve only for dental work and my father, but that doesn't mean I would rat them out. Pretty much the only important thing I never, 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 never rat. This quote shows even when people don't like others, their loyalty to their classmate re remains. Another important aspect of the novel Looking for Alaska was characterization. It helped create a storyline as well as develop a theme. The following two characters are two very important characters that we think showed this very well. Alaska can be described as impulsive, self-destructive, mysterious, bubbly, moody, rebellious, reckless, and deeply conflicted. Her guilt for not taking action and calling 911 as a child when her mother was dying affect her greatly and significantly contribute to her personality traits. Alaska's fear of delaying action again caused her to be impulsive. Pudge reflects on this after he learns about Alaska's mother she often does not think about the consequences of her actions to the point where she is reckless. An example of this is when she does not follow the colonel's plan for the barn night prank. She makes a decision in the moment and sends out more progress reports than she is supposed to, without foreseeing the increased risk of getting caught. In addition, Alaska rebels against rules and pushes the envelope by smoking where she isn't supposed to and playing an elaborate pranks, both of which risk getting in trouble. Also due to overwhelming guilt that consumes her, she participates in self-destructive activities such as an excessive smoking and drinking. These activities serve as a temporary coping mechanism and distraction from her internal struggles. Also, I believe that Alaska didn't care for her life and she hoped these substances would lead to an earlier death. Looking for Alaska places an emphasis on complex characters, dialogue, and relationships between characters. Two major characters, Pudge and Alaska, play important roles in the novel and will be further analyzed. Pudge can be described as an awkward person who lacks social skills, burying himself in his reading of biographies and memorizing last words in order to escape the fact that he doesn't really have any true friends. He feels that he does not belong, and after reading the last words of Francois Rabelais about seeking a great perhaps, he sets off to seek it for himself. 
Pudge is an optimistic and motivated to find a place of belonging and improved life at his new school. Pudge's character develops a great deal throughout the story. When he first arrives at Culver Creek, he is a passive character, simply following whatever others tell him and having low expectations for his life. As an awkward person who lacks social skills, he is keen to find a place where he feels as he belongs as time goes on. Pudge overcomes his shy, passive personality and creates a strong identity for himself. He no longer buries him in his biographies, takes more risks, becomes more assertive, and tries new things. His friends help him live a more exciting life, and he learns what true friendship is. And that concludes our podcast. We hope you enjoyed, and we'll come back next week for another exciting episode.